Uh, welcome uh, to this afternoon's event titled A Better Life for the Workers. It is uh, by and with visual artist Jen Liu. The event, uh, the event is a part of the Alternative Biennial Patterns in Resistance, and it is co-produced with the curatorial platform Ariel Feminisms in the Aesthetics. And uh, I want to thank Jen and Nina and Khan from Ariel for meeting us here today for this conversation, uh, which will mainly circle around Lou's work on the psychological, political, and legal issues around the shaping of the industrial uh, work life in modern China. My name is Dia Antonsen, and I'm the co-founder of the Copenhagen-based uh, curatorial platform, Laboratory for Aesthetics and Ecology, and uh, we are curating this year's iteration of LCPH, which is ho hosted by Fabriken for Kunst and Design, the factory for art and design. And Patterns and Resistance treats and explore the, um, explores the many messy nuts between craft and technology, relations of economy, labor, and power, it explores the practice, different practices of resistance, intergenerational knowledge sharing, questions of care work and community building. The biennial was supposed to take place in May this year as a physical manifestation, but uh, due to COVID-19, we have had to transform it into the digital sphere, which is also why we meet here today at Zoom. Uh, and I want to recommend all of you to uh, follow us uh, on our website, lcbh.dk, on Facebook and Instagram to follow our program the next couple of weeks. We have talks, workshops, uh, artworks and other sort of materials that, uh, that will um, yeah, take place uh, until uh, September 19th, where we end with a physical, small physical event uh, at the, at the uh, factory. So uh, also stay tuned for more information on that. And please join us if you are in Copenhagen and able to. Um, but so today we are meeting visual artist Jen Liu and the curatorial platform Ariel, which I'm just going to introduce. Uh, Jen Liu is a visual artist based in New York and Vermont. Liu is working in video, animation, performance, choreography, biomaterial and painting to explore topics around national identity, gendered economics, uh, neoliberal industrial labor, and the re-motivating motiv motivating of archival artifacts. In 2019, she received the Creative Capital Award. In 2018, the LACMA Art and Technology Lab Grant. In 2017, the Guggenheim Fellowship in Film and Video. She has presented work at the Whitney Museum, uh, MoMA, the New, New Museum New York, Smithsonian American Art Museum, DC, Royal Academy and ICA in London, Kunsthaus Zürich, and at the Shanghai Biennial in 2014 and 2019 Singapore Biennial, and many, many more places. IEL Feminisms in the Aesthetics is a platform and interface to, to, to the development of and dissemination of exhibitions of high artistic quality centered on new ramifications of feminisms in the aesthetic field. Through facilitation of artistic research, the project see, seeks to expand and nuance the framework of understanding the field of feminism and to co-create a contact area where the topics can be accessed. The initiative is Nordic and internationally orientated with a long-term perspective on branching out to new collaborations, contexts and situations. Ariel is initiated by Nina Wilk and co-run and curated the Kahn Westerbor Andersen and located in Kvindernes Bygning. Jen Liu and uh, Ariel collaborated earlier this year and uh, you will be telling us much more about this, about it in this talk. And uh, I also want to mention that, that later this year, Jen, Ariel and the Laboratory for Aesthetics and Ecology will be publishing uh, A Better Life for Workers and uh, in a new iteration, and uh, we're very excited to introduce your work here in the Danish literary context. Context, Jen, and uh, thank you so much for, for uh, yeah, being willing to share your work and uh, doing this collaboration. That's going to be very excited, and uh, yeah, for the listeners, please stay tuned for, for more information on this. So uh, let's get this talk started. Uh, we would like to invite all of you listeners out there to invite any questions that you may have for Jen, Nina and Khan in the chat window, and then they will try to answer it 
uh, all of them and uh, yeah either they'll do it along the way during the conversation or maybe in the end as it fits best. best. Uh, halfway through we'll also be asking if uh, anyone is in need of a break especially of course the uh, Jen and uh, Nina and Khan just a five minute, minute short break or whether uh, you would like to just continue. Yeah, so Jen, Khan, and Nina, I will leave the scene for you now. Uh, and again, just uh, thank you tremendously uh, for taking part in Patterns of Resistance. Thank you so much, Dia, for the yeah, introduction. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody, for, for being there, um, listening to us uh, speak today, especially Jen. Thank you also <laughs> for accepting the invitation. Um, both um, a part of our collaboration as we've been working with you now for quite some time, um, but also for this talk. Mm. And uh, yeah, um, maybe I will just say a few words about um, mainly what this conversation is going to be about today. Um, for this event, uh, you will uh, read from the publication A Better Life uh, for the Workers. Uh, which originally is um, an internal training manual for Hong Kong-based NGO workers, worker empowerment education program for workers in Shenzhen. Um, more widely, it was published in um, 2012. Um, the manual comprises of two volumes that describe and analyze the psychological, political, and legal issues shaping industrial work life in modern China. Um, and um, going from Chinese to English, the A Better Life for the Workers is uh, translated uh, by Jen and her mother. Um, and just as Dia mentioned, the publication will be uh, in print this winter in collaboration with Ayel with a visual side designed by, by Jen. And um, um, maybe I can also just say that the manual uh, consists of two volumes where one is dealing with how to organize and describes like political and legal issues regarding the process of strike, while volume two is centered around emotional labor and how to stay mentally stable in an uh, explosive environment. Um, but this is also something especially that Jen is going to say a lot more about uh, today. And yeah. Yeah, maybe we could just also say that uh, the reason why our collaboration started was uh, that we invited Jen to take part in our uh, two-year program in our first cycle of exhibitions here at Ariel. And she just recently uh, finished exhibiting here in Ariel uh, with her work Gold Loop, which we will also talk a little bit about later in this, uh, in this talk. Um, but yeah, that's how it all started. And this is actually due to Corona, COVID-19. It's actually our uh, usual time of day for talking, <laughs> Jen. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, we had a lot of meetings, <laughs> 10 a.m., 4 p.m., and mm. just like this. And it's been so nice uh, having these conversations the yeah. past almost a year. Mm. Um, yeah, and we're excited to, to share this, um, these talks um, also, and yeah, to share the reading of the manual. Yeah, uh, and I think with the, the structure that Dia just mentioned, um, we will also have a sort of, a, it follows quite well with a, with a reading uh, by Jen, and then a conversation and questions, uh, and then a small break if necessary, and then a second reading. And followed by questions again. Yeah, and please, yeah, if you have any questions, just write them in the chat. And if you prefer to be anonymous, just write that. Otherwise, we'll mention your uh, first name um, in front of the question. And um, yeah, so Jen. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that lovely intro. Yeah, it's been. It has been a year of really um, wonderful conversations, truly. Uh, and we will continue with this one. <laughs> hmm. 
Do we uh, do we want to get started with reading, or how are you thinking to grasp this work, uh, Jen, or introducing it for uh, for new listeners, also new viewers? Uh, yeah, um, I believe um, uh, if it's okay with you, probably um, we can. It's already ten twenty. Um, my time. Um, perhaps it would be good to start the reading already, shall we? Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, um, I, I believe it's I'll read part of it and then we'll pop out into some questions between us. Is that right? We'll mm -hmm. see where we're at in terms of time, perhaps read some more and then more questions and then some perhaps a break somewhere in there, right? As mm -hmm. you said. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Um, there will be just a just a couple of slides, which I'm not going to actually uh, speak about too much uh, as they show up. I don't need to, I don't think I need to contextualize them too much. But if any of you have any questions about this, uh, feel free to write it into the chat window. Uh, there's also, of course, a captioning for each of those images, so you know generally the source, uh, and it loosely relates to some of the um, themes and is also something to look at while I'm reading besides my face, <laughs> which is, you know, is a thing. So uh, let me go ahead and open that. Um, okay, good. All right, so, okay, I will start. Uh, most of what I'll be reading from today is actually from the first volume. Um, a Better Life for the Workers. Every time we walk down the street, we always see people who are much richer than us. Although we're at the bottom of society, and every morning we open our eyes to a race for survival, we also see the city's high-rise buildings, busy traffic, people feasting and drinking, and we know that the gap between the rich and us is not a minor thing. As workers, we make products that are exported to foreign countries, and we also have access to more foreign products than, we, than when we were in the countryside. Back in the village, we may have been curious about the American movie Titanic or had a rare sip of Coca-Cola. But in the city, foreign brands are everywhere. Mobile phones are Samsung or Nokia, McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken ads are broadcast on TV every hour. Toyotas and BMWs always pass by and loud K-pop music plays on the street. We may not be able to afford these things, but we are always in contact with them. Perhaps we produce them in the factory or see them when we go to foreign supermarkets, Walmart, Tesco, Jusco. The environment in which we live is also influenced by globalization. In order to attract foreign capital, Countless acres of farmland were sold and turned into factory and real estate projects. The Wukan protests in 2011 arose in response to the village council conspiring with real estate developers to sell off villagers' farmland for real estate purposes, depriving the farmers of their land. Capital, because its nature is to pursue profit maximization, flows around the world, leaving, leading, to the leading to the migration of many toxic, harmful, polluting, and low-tech labor-intensive industries to developing countries and regions. In other words, Developed countries don't want to bear the environmental costs. The poor regions hold the hot potato.
A few years ago, it was reported that 70% of the world's e-waste was dumped in China. Unwanted cell phones, computers, and electrical appliances are processed in China with an incineration resulting in air pollution, wastewater, and runoff polluting our water. Workers get sick when they work in such an environment for a long time. Some workers say that in their hometown at the upstream source of the Pearl River, they cannot drink the water because of factory pollution. Instead, they have to buy water from Chengcheng City. How ridiculous it is. The government is well aware of these issues, but if they increase supervision and standards, costs will rise, investments may be lost, so they turn a blind eye. In 2009, there were serious chemical pollution incidents in the hometown of many Hunan workers. In Chengtao village, Luyang City, a chemical plant producing iridium illegally, discharged sewage which not only polluted the nearby farmland, the rice and vegetables planted by farmers and farm animals all had to be destroyed, but it also damaged dozens of adjacent industrial base and township enterprises. More seriously, more than 500 villagers were diagnosed with cadmium poisoning and many people died. Iridium is widely used in the electronics industry, aerospace industry, alloy manufacturing, solar cells, and other high-tech industries. But the production of this precious metal endangered the safety of an entire village. There is no protection living in the city and our hometowns are in crisis. If we escape the problem, where can we find shelter? It's time for us to think. The land was originally owned by our working people for farming and production. But for the so sake of social development, we gave way to the factory and the city, and we became the so-called proletariat. Except for selling our labor, we have nothing else to exchange for life necessities. We first lost the land, and now our labor is sold to the boss to help the boss achieve his production plan. And I'll break there. That's okay. Thank you. Should I stop the screen share or should I leave up this image? Um, I both have a, uh, we both have a visual of you and a smaller, and then it's really nice to see the, the imagery actually. Okay. I meant to see. Let's pop to that one. That one's nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've, we've had the chance to pre read uh, some of the material from. A better life for the workers also so what also you've been just reading to us right now um it really describes some of the um conditions and 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 this and the status of the workers in in china today um can you tell us about how you came across the manual and also, what inspired you to do a translation? Sure, of course. Um, so, uh, prior to 2016, um, I had been working, uh, a lot of my work had 
uh, was about um, industrial production and particularly um, the fantasy or the kind of cultural construction of industrial production as a kind of um, point of um, nostalgia. Uh, nostalgia mixed um, very virulently with tax policy um, here in the US. Uh, and um, thinking about the past of industrial production brought me to the present of industrial production, in fact. Um, and that's where I kind of arrived uh, in 2016. Um, and so uh, in, two, in the summer of 2016, uh, I actually had a residency with Parasite, uh, which is in Hong Kong. Uh, it's an institution in Hong Kong, a wonderful, amazing institution <laughs> in Hong Kong. Um, so, uh, what that meant was I had six weeks uh, and what I intended to do during that six weeks was really just to um, uh, get a feel for the city, start some new ideas, and also meet with as many labor NGOs and reporters and lawyers and activists um, working with contemporary labor issues in South China. Uh, and so um, that is what I did. Um, and um, because I had already been working around the issue of uh, labor, but it's the labor past, um, a lot of my kind of prior research had had to do with accumulating, um, uh, let's say, inaccessible archives, right? Or archives of things like, mm -hmm. Um, worker um, newsletters, um, or which were uh, particularly in the US were quite popular. Um, but no one sees them now, obviously, and they're very seldomly um, archived properly. So that was a, a deep interest of mine. So when I was meeting the NGOs, um, I was like, well, you know, certainly they've got a lot of paper material, uh, which is very much a part of their mission. Um, and uh, information and knowledge um, production. Um, and so uh, when I met with a lot of the NGOs, I would ask them for uh, if there was any uh, materials that I could purchase or I could take that was part of their kind of um, project and process as um, organizations. And worker empowerment, or one of uh, several um, really uh, amazing NGOs in Hong Kong working primarily in Shenzhen and that kind of uh, lower region, uh, they had uh, the, A Better Life for the Workers, um, which was a two volume book, as you guys mentioned, and actually is a sort of, it was published in 2013 in production in 2012 with updated more or less updated uh, numbers from 2012, but was actually a kind of a cool of the materials that they were using on the field from about 2007 to 2011 um, mm -hmm. for their activists and related um, associated activists that weren't necessarily worker empowerment activists, but um, part of the um, group um, in general. And so uh, that's how I came about it. They gave it to me and I was like, eh, what is this beautiful book? I mean, you can see it. It's like this totally amazing looking book um, with very little illustrations. Um, and uh, so as soon as I brought it back to the, and they told me a little bit about what was in it, um, but it's all in Chinese and of all the things that I'm terrible at is actually reading Chinese. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, really, honestly, it was a bit of a mystery what was inside of it. Obviously, I knew um, general outlines, um, but as soon as I got back home uh, to the U.S. Uh, later that year in 2016, scanned it out um, and started the very slow process of uh, translating it with my mother. Um, and the two volumes are still in a perpetual process of like slow um, translation uh, and so I it's still not done um, 
you know, there's only so much I can demand of my mother at any given point in time. Um, so, the, of course, but that's part of the fun of the process. And so, um, so I feel like ever in all these years since then, um, it's a body of text that I keep on rediscovering and decoding and appreciating anew. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, you told us that it was one of the, I don't know, maybe primary sources or one of the publications that you have been returning to over and over and again. And we also met it through um, working with Gold Blue 2020 with you this springtime, where it was part of the manuscript yeah. um, that was in Gold Loop. So we also first had like a glimpse of, of, of this voice within uh, the publication that was describing the transition from um, a worker living in the countryside, like knowing and then moving to the city, becoming this uh, migrant worker as they are uh, given the name of when in the city, even if it's a uh, move within a country. <laughs> Um, so that was, yeah, quite special <laughs> to, to meet it that way. Also through all of the other voices that you bring into, to the manuscript of, of Gold Loop. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I appreciate, it's, it's interesting because in the, in the context of a kind of, um, a script for video, um, which <laughs> I don't know who's in the participant. <laughs> window exactly um, and I'm trying not to keep an eye on it but um, uh, you can see it's it's very much um, about trying to weave together um, various strands that kind of uh, come together and uh, impact each other in ways that aren't are, are unexpected and also um, have a certain amount of emotional impact um, but one of the things about um, uh, being able to publish a translation of this uh, this manual in further length is that actually it it creates a more intact picture of a kind of perspective that I we very very seldom to never get exposure to um, in the uh, loosely let's say about the West in the U.S. and in Europe. And it's particularly this um, voice of um, activists and activists who used to be workers, speaking mm -hmm. workers. Um, and um, one of the important things, and the reason why I am enthralled by this text amongst other things is that um, in my work, uh, this question of um, not indulging in um, the spectacle of suffering um, is really important to me. Um, and so a document like this is really um, uh, remarkable for me in as far as it's not about um, the spectacle of suffering so much as it's a kind of um, recognition of likeness and solidarity um, and a kind of thinking through of possibility um, that is not just about a sort of victimhood, but is very much about um, practical futures, if we can say that. Um, and one that has some kind of fidelity to um, socialist equality, ideals of socialist equality. Yeah, but it's also a manual that's written by workers for workers. Exactly. Yeah. And you said uh, early on when we started talking about this manual and um, turning it into a publication, you told us that the manual is um, predominantly written by women. Um, and, uh, and your artistic feature also uh, in the past many years uh, features only female characters or, yeah, let's say, um, could you tell us about the incentive to work with and from uh, the female position? 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I would actually just make a very, very slight correction to that. Um, certainly, um, this document is a uh, collected text, um, and I um, suspect, although for the text itself, I cannot say authoritatively that it was written primarily by women, but I can say that the um, uh, the the field activists that I met were primarily women for the most part, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the electronics um, electronics factories um, in Shenzhen, it's, which is also um, very heavily female. Also, um, so but that's not to say that um, the leaning on um, a sort of female identity. Um, as a kind of um, position or um, who exists <laughs> visually in um, my uh, videos. Um, it's not to say that it's representational, of course, it's an abstraction um, and kind of speculation. Um, why? I don't, I, it's hard to say um, why. Uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons why, um, but um, they're very, they're quite different ones. Um, and some of them actually originate in my older work, which I don't want to get too far into the weeds on. Um, so perhaps I'll uh, focus on the more contemporaneous uh, ones. Um, I think that um, right. there is something about um, the, it originates in this kind of idea of the um, activist um, and illuminating what exactly that is not as a historical object, but one that is in fact reality. Um, and I think that on the one hand, there's a certain amount of correction that should be made. Again, not to say that it's um, uh, an accurate portrait or 100% of the entities in my videos to be women, but um, it, pr it might actually correct a kind of a reparative idea of what an activist can or should be. Um, further on from that, um, I think that there's just, oh, I don't know, there's something reparative about um, just, I don't know how else to say this, but I, I think it's probably in the air with what your project is and uh, what this um, festival may be about. But um, gosh, this is like a slightly awkward answer. I'm, I wish I had a more fluid answer for this, but it's, it's so multifaceted, it's hard to answer it in some ways. Um, it's, we still live in a moment in which um, very, it's still not normative to center the stories of women. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. Certainly as, and then there's the other side for me, which is that it's certainly not normative, particularly in Western perspectives to center the stories of Asian women. Mm -hmm. um, so those two things together, uh, come together for me. Um, and- um, And a class question as well, right? Indeed, of course, right, exactly. Um, and then to, yeah, so we can compound this with working class, like truth, like industrial <laughs> class that doesn't exist um, as a kind of um, representational center. Mm. Uh, it's always being looked at, but not being looked, not being seen from within, right? Mm. So the work in it, in some ways is, trying to address that um but in perhaps in some ways um the kind of repair that it would take to recenter 
um, female voices um, takes a certain amount of extremity or abstraction in order to place it where it always should have been. I don't know if, I hope that makes sense. It's, it sounds very odd, but um, it's something about what needs to be done in order to create a new kind of order or a new kind of equality, um, which is not available to us yet, really. Such a nice answer. <laughs> and we just went right into the core of <laughs> sure. the thing. Of course. <laughs> for me and for me not to be <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and that's so nice, but I'm also sitting to thinking that maybe we should speak a little bit about um, the publication from the outside or just um, a lot of the people that have been listening or that are listening at the moment are participating with us today um, is meeting it for the first time. And when we introduced it, we just briefly said that there was two volumes and they had these very different um, uh, approaches to uh, being a worker in the contemporary China and maybe you could just say a little bit more about like how that how that shows in the volumes and especially the um, you understand that the manual is is um, is something that gives you tools in terms of how to organize but there's also the other one that talks more about the emotional side of how to be in this exploitive environment and how to mentally be present and, and contain and care for oneself uh, while being a worker and maybe some of the support or empathy and solidarity also sure. appears in, in that. Indeed, indeed. Um, so the first, I mean, they both have um, a really um, intense sort of, um, um, emotional appeal, I would actually say. Um, I think that the first one is very much, uh, the first volume is very much around laying out the facts, um, uh, breaking down what exactly globalization means and what it, um, uh, how it manifests in their everyday lives and how they actually share these conditions that it's not just one person suffering, but it's a whole systemic sort of um, capitalist um, uh, issue um, uh, that they all sort of share um, in so many different ways. Um, and so kind of breaking out all the aspects of that um, and fairly uh, clear um, ways. Uh, and then uh, talking about um, once that's established a kind of likeness, a kind of shared concern, um, talking about what constitutes a solidarity, right? Um, and talking about how that it's such a simple thing. <laughs> Uh, and there's this uh, image uh, or this this uh, description that I love, which is that um, you know it's not so hard to share some snacks together. This is how we start, right? This is how this is how um, social solidarity and collective resistance starts. Is hey, why don't you smile even if they don't smile back? Let's have some snacks together. You know, it's so it's but it. And it sounds, um, I don't mean to diminish it, it's, it, that is really um, how um, one can think about solidarity, particularly with a population that in fact is quite displaced and quite isolated from uh, their families, right? They are truly migrant workers within their own country, right? Because of, again, which they go into quite in detail, uh, which as an outsider is quite interesting to understand. Um, because I'm not a, there's there's not an awful lot of um, nuance, I believe, um, in the ways that we understand our own economies um, interacting with the labor structures in China as they are today. Um, so it gets into detail and gives it a kind of um, human anchor. Right? We understand how it affects them. Um, and then the second volume um, is very much oriented around uh, uh, actually. Um, uh, uh, first-hand accounts at length um, and you got to see part of it but that's part of the um, part that is still in translation 
<laughs> from mom. Um, but, um, but so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it just goes into them um, in a fact, uh, in, in a great length relatively. Um, so, but what that means is you get to hear about some of these themes that came up in volume one, but in a long kind of narrative stretch. Right. So you hear about somebody uh, who used to be a um, uh, mushroom farmer, right? Um, and how the market for mushroom farming, like for his family had been involved, had a mushroom farm for a really long time, lived off of it, everything was fine, good. Uh, and then all of this stuff with um, the economic reform around 2001, the market completely collapsed in mushrooms. So then he had to become a migrant worker in factories. Right? And then once he started uh, accumulating um, uh, injuries at his job, um, what he then did to try to get compensated for his workplace injuries, you know, and, and so it goes on like this. So again, this kind of idea of like, in the first one, kind of laying out the framework, but in the second one, creating these kind of um, non-fictional, true life um, uh, consolidations of what was spoken about before, on kind of like uh, one after the other after the other. Um, yeah, so, uh, and we can kind of imagine how that works on the field, of course, right? It's like, you can lay out the framework, but um, to really relate to somebody, um, to really um, find shared ground, it of course helps to have a a story that they really relate to. Right? So that's volume two. Yeah. yeah. Could you also say that um, it also has to do with the voices being um, so un unspoken or not given any um, media attention or um, press? And in that sense, the manual also functions as a sort of a solidary piece that you can reflect on your own like in between the the workers lives knowing about uh, other workers conditions um sharing them and knowing the the scale of of, of um the scarcity of of of, of their lives um, i don't know if that was a real question <laughs> I think so. I, I, I will, I will dignify that as a real question. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, I, I think that it actually, that actually raises another interesting question though, is, um, what do these, um, what do these publications operate as outside of being sort of internal working documents, right? For, um, for field work. Um, uh, if, it's, if it's published for a larger, um, larger readership, how does it then um, work, right? And so certainly um, in the second volume, let's say outside of the, its originary context, uh, yes, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a document that actually gives outsiders keys to understanding also like how within a single lifetime, like all these different shifts of society, shifts of the economic structures and um, uh, obviously the context is, and the kind, of, um, the, the kind of proliferation of possibilities of being not only exploited, but resisting against exploitation open up within that lifetime um, in ways that we don't have access to. And uh, not only in media, but um, news media, not only in news media, but also actually in documentary media. It's just not the kind of stories that we have access to um, in any form. Um, mm. yeah. And then also you mentioned in one of our talks, Jen, that um, which also comes out from the manual that these lives are also hidden within the districts within China, like this, um, that you are not allowed to be seen, you're not you're kept kind of in this uh, state of 
the factory or the complex of the factory. Indeed. Uh, yeah, but that's why it's so important. Um, but then let's go back to then like the original context of this um, document, right? It's like invisible to the outside, but very visible to each other. Right? Mm -hmm. So where does, um, where does resistance need to originate? It needs to actually originate at the grassroots level because um, the, the um, necessity, the, the kind of weight of having anything possibly happen from the outside is like so profoundly overwhelming actually. Um, and there's so many of them that actually share the same, very, very similar stories, um, share similar conditions of work and life, um, that this is why we need to you know, sit down and get to know each other, get it, you know, get it together. Um, so in some ways it's, we, it's, it's um, illuminating for us to understand and see it on, as kind of secondary audiences, but let's do say that um, its primary purpose um, and um, necessity is um, the first um, purpose, the first audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm just seeing that uh, time is, um, we have about half an hour to go. So um, should, uh, is anyone in need of a break? Um, how do you feel, Jen? I'm fine. I can't see the uh, chat window, but I'm fine. I'm personally fine. Yeah, okay, let's have a look. I think also we're fine um, from the participants' side. Um, oh. If it's okay with everybody, we can, we can continue. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go on and uh, read the, um, the, the second half of the text that I have prepared. Um, so without going into some of these very uh, a longer first-hand accounts, which you know, if you had a longer time, you'd be in love with. Um, uh, although, oh, there's a little bit in this bit. Um, what I'm going to start with, um, actually, the first, um, the first paragraph refers to uh, Zhang uh, Haichao. Um, and uh, it's somebody that um, I can't, um, I'm not going to get into too far, but uh, prior to the section that I'm reading, uh, they describe um, uh, his um, issues. Uh, he's a, a factory worker who uh, got terminal, uh, terminal lung cancer, a quite a famous example around 2010-2011 of um, terminal lung cancer from stone dust from uh, working around um, stone, some kind of stone production or cement production. Um, and um, the battles he had to um, get in order to claim workers' compensation for his um, lung disease um, was a huge, huge deal um, because it was so profoundly um, messed up. Right, um, and it, it had, the nature of his illness was so severe, and they would still not exceed. Right, so, so that that's who they're referring to. Uh, so, better life for the workers. Reading part two. Do you want one or two heroes to change the status quo? We know that the same things that happen to Zhang Haichao can happen to us at any time. We workers use our specialized skills to build high-rise buildings and ship containers of goods to the rest of the world. China's economic development relies on us to provide labor, but our wages are not enough to survive. When we get sick or injured, we have to rely on ourselves. We endure the separation from our families, the pain of discrimination, and we always have to struggle to get the protection we deserve. Will we also have to open up our chests and lungs like Zhang Haichao? If there is no hero, what else can we rely on? We hope the law will protect us, but it often favors the powerful. 
We expect the government to come help us, but these dreams are often empty. We fight each for ourselves, again and again beat by blows. In the end, we find that we have no other choice but to rely on each other, unite with other workers. Quote, it's almost time to get off work and the foreman says to stop work. We're waiting to leave. We finally got our cards punched, changed out of our dustproof suits, switched out shoes, and run down to the fourth floor. I rushed to the cafeteria and found that there were already one or 200 people lined up in front of about four windows. There was no way. I took my tray and stood at the end, waited and waited, looking at people who had meals in their rice bowls. Finally, it's my turn, but I find that there's nothing left of the dishes I was thinking about this whole time. And the rest are either what I don't like or what everyone doesn't like. There's no way around it. So I just hit a few dishes and fill my stomach. Sometimes there's no food left and I can only eat pickles. My colleagues always blame me for running too slow. If I run fast, I'll have food. Although I don't argue, I still think that there are so many people and not enough dishes. If I'm not the last one, someone else would be the last one. Either I can't get food or someone else can't get food. It has nothing to do with speed. And this is um, uh, a section of some a writer working, uh, a worker writing under a pseudonym. I love coriander. <laughs> and this a little text um, this person wrote is my day. So, uh, and then we're out of that uh, text uh, by the worker. In recent years, the media has from time to time reported on worker strikes. Of course, this means that there's greater awareness of workers' resistance. But compared to China's huge migrant worker population, this is a drop in the bucket. Workers struggle to gain the attention of the media, but media mostly concentrates on scenes of conflict, such as how many people stopped working, if the road has been blocked, how much police and security forces have been dispatched and whether the boss gives in or does not give in. In the end, workers accept the conditions, then return to work. Faced with this type of news, people who are not present will always have different opinions. Of course, some people support the workers and feel they're fighting for what they deserve. But some people think that if they're dissatisfied with the factory, they should live with it. Many other, many other people suffer, so what? However, on what basis do we discuss whether workers suffer? What is their daily life like? If we don't know or have never experienced it, these kinds of comments are worthless. Whether you want to admit it or not, our will only decides a small part of our daily lives. To a greater extent, it is determined by the production system. This is obviously shown by I Love Coriander, who records a moment of eating in the factory cafeteria. Perhaps this is a familiar scene that factory workers encounter every day. What is worth remembering? Because these things happen too often, we get numb. And when we try to tell them in our own language and describe the details, it becomes just another thing. Our food charges go to pay just for pickles. There are so many people in the factory and everyone is here to work. Why can't there be enough food in the factory to feed everyone, making everyone fight for a meal? It's not the first time 
bosses tighten food expenses. But where do the resources of the factory go? Are the life necessities of workers the first to be subtracted and sacrificed? And that's it. Oh, I did miss my uh, last slide. So that's actually some workers on the street. Um, and that's it. Uh, one thing, just uh, context. Um, uh, workers are paid very, 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 very little. Um, and further on, um, the uh, costs of feeding them while they're working, as well as housing them on these campuses, uh, is deducted from their pay. Uh, without their choice. There's very uh, few other choices for food in these kind of um, industrial complexes. Uh, so, uh, so when they're talking about um, the food being given, um, they pay for it, but there's not enough. Right. Sorry, I'm just letting that sink in a little bit. Sure, sure, of course, of course no worries. No, but it's, um, it's really like, I think one of the things that struck us also with this work is that it has a very personal voice alongside of like bringing out like uh, examples of like daily life descriptions from, from workers. And then next to that, you stand with like a, some some kind of sense of of, of the amount of, of of workers that exists um, that each has like the individual um, like I love coriander lives <laughs> with yeah. them yeah that's um, that's very special mm. yeah the first hand accounts yeah um. Um, I'm also thinking when, when you're touching upon like these, um, like uh, the first hand experiences, like I love coriander, and um, like how, how would you say, or is it um, in any like uh, feasible way, like any tangible way, um, like influencing the type of um, like the conditions for the workers um, today in like for the Chinese workers um, and their labor rights. Do you see like that this kind of uh, activist work with a manual like this has, um, has a real potential for change or is, has it already started or like what is your view on that? Sure. Um, uh... Yes. Um, um, yes. Um, and as far as um, uh, surely um, there they have a, a copy of this uh, that has been updated um, uh, and is being used in some form, I'm sure. Um, but I cannot say enough about how imperiled uh, activists were even in 2006, but have um, even become even more so in peril now. Um, so it becomes increasingly difficult actually to do things like go um, and do worker education um, on the field. Uh, uh, yeah, and this has to do with some of those um, extradition laws that um, are really um, existent, uh, which are profoundly um, uh, so, um, because in some ways, like you could, um, a worker could go, um, a former worker activist could go and do stuff, but they could always um, go find a little, a bit of safe haven, perhaps. In the um, so, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, I hope so. Um, I can't, I can't report how it might be being used right now. Um, but if it is being used right now, I'm not sure that I should be the one who's privy to that information. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Yeah. But yeah, I mean, definitely this it's, it's, um, I think that, um, there might be some other forms that exist right now. Um, any, um, number of websites, blogs, um, kind of private as, as private as you can be, um, blogging sites and things like that, um, where people can still kind of squeak out some, uh, information and solidarity here and there. Um, for sure. Yeah, it's, I think uh, one of the things that comes out in the text is also that there's different strategies being presented uh, in the publication, and um, some some of them are most of uh, traditional or uh, very known used <laughs> strategies like protests and, and strikes. But then it also seems like like the cell phone and and uh, the possibility to share information. For instance, while there is a strike, um, in terms to like uh, reorganize or having negotiations with uh, the managers or the, or the bosses of, of the factories, um, becomes another strategy that's uh, uh, like a contemporary possibility now. Yeah. But what is also like really interesting about this text because it is both uh, informative and also poetic some places it's also that it it feels like it resonates and uh, leaps beyond its um initial borders or you know, its initial uh, public um that when reading the text it's as you said before like what constitutes solidarity how do you how do you bring about this uh, grassroots change and we're thinking about you know equal rights we're thinking also about like labor rights and working from a precarious situation in as art field workers even so privileged in in terms of where we're from and yeah what kind of uh uh yeah initial pedestal we have from the world if you could call it that um if there's still some parallels in terms of how you fight for yeah basic um, basic labor rights and and how you unionize and yeah so I found that really um, inspiring um, I, mean, I think it's also I want to stress also uh, again on that kind of like that kind of split that's already happened and of course our what we're working on together will be like the next chapter in it right uh, going into like the art art worker uh, world, but I think that um, the, as soon as they publish this uh, document for a uh, larger um, uh, readership, I think it already starts to um, create this other kind of situation, which is that um, perhaps uh, some of the politic and some of the um, some of the resistance has to do, or let's say, just the the politic has to do with us also connecting. All these kind of objects that we're using, like for instance, where we can see on the screen the worker strike at IBM Lenovo, right? So we can think of like uh, maybe we don't have PCs. I'm not sure what computers we're looking at right now, but in any case, we are looking at some computer where feasibly um, it could be um, made by uh, workers who would be just as um, excited to perhaps strike as these ones were in 2014. Um, and um, these stories about um, not having enough to eat, not starving, but just like that slow kind of deterioration of just, you know, um, being squeezed and being sort of like over um, overused as a human somehow, um, that that is, um, that multiple of those stories are actually tethered uh, to everything that we use that is sitting on our desk right um, and I think that that that's part of the politic here too and is the reason um, to read it particularly in the back. Um, yeah. Now also speaking into the care so that you're able to give yourself or yeah give others. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, or to think like, a, I mean, we can, if we think about, um, yeah, care, 
structures of care. Um, it is built on a certain, um, uh, the foundation of any care is actually like an action, a kind of action approach to empathy, right? So an empathy that isn't a passive empathy, but it's a it's an active empathy that you can then act upon and collectively share, right? Um, but the whole thing is like we live in this world full of these abstract objects and abstraction, right? whether they're abstract themselves or whether their origins are, have completely been abstracted, regardless, um, that they are abstracted from their um, their empathic origins, right? Um, and having being able to access that again, um, or to reconnect it with the stories that our objects are uh, scrubbed clean of, um, is then again the basis for something else that um, I'm not sure if it once we start getting into international politics, I'm not, maybe we can call them a kind of politic of care. Um, but I, you know, I think that there's a sort of something um, more generalizable as kind of like, um, I don't know, human rights, global human rights. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't really establish that uh, very well uh, without uh, empathy related to the labor that underruns uh, everything around us. Yeah, but also, yeah, it speaks a lot about like, um, like the precarious work, like the scarcity. I could see so many fields where it could um, resonate with, where it would, yeah, really sort of find an audience uh, outside of, yeah, what it was written to have. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I was also, I mean, we worked together on the Gold Loop 2020, as, as, as mentioned, uh, by showing it here um, uh, at our um, platform in uh, June. And uh, the script also brought out uh, a lot of other material that you have sourced this um, inaccessible archive. Uh, as you called it earlier. And I remember also another um, strategy um, that was being used in a different context uh, for another situation that was called the anti-colonial collective disappearance strategy, which is um, also like, in some sense, it's another context, but it was born out of like um, extreme scarcity and, and, and crisis. Mm -hmm. And if it makes sense, would you tell us a little bit about this or maybe some of the other source material that related to a better life for the workers um, that would give us yeah, a better insight to, to this publication also in terms of um, these strategies that are being shared amongst uh, vulnerable uh, physicians within China? Sure, sure. Um, I think that, um, so uh, collective disappearance, <clears throat> right, uh, which is um, what you uh, reference uh, in a way, although I prefer what it is that you said to collective disappearance, actually. But um, it's a uh, it's um, one of the many methodologies uh, outlined by the um, oh, I forget his name exactly, but the the Einstein Institute, uh, uh, who kind of compiled all these methods of nonviolent protest. Um, and I what I was intrigued by was this idea of um, thinking through. Um, thinking through um, hopefulness and cynicism at the same time, um, my own hopefulness and also my own cynicism um, at the same time, but also this idea of something which seems terrible and, but also maybe it has yields possibilities, but then also maybe it doesn't, 
do you know what I mean? So like this idea of like a circle that's just kind of like as a that that Ouroboros it's just like sort of eating itself. It keeps on generating, but it keeps on consuming. And uh, which one is the good side? No one really knows. Um, so. So collective disappearance um, is this idea. Um, uh, they cite it, the Einstein Institute does, uh, actually this one particular writer does cite it as this, um, uh, as a historical model in which um, particularly in the face of uh, colonial powers, um, particularly British colonial power, how um, certain um, uh, populations in China would um, go just disappear. Right before they before somebody could come and um, levy a tax on them, they would just like disappear, take all their stuff with them, bury all their stuff, and just like, right. So there's no one to tax, right? Can't be found, right? The ultimate form of anti-colonial resistance. If you can't kill the colonizer, then you just like disappear and you can't be found by them. And so they can't they can't extract anything from you if they can't find you. So. Um, so, right, so <laughs> resistance to extraction, um, human and natural resources, right? So, um, so it was interesting to think about that and put that, a mention of that in the video at the same time as what you have already like referenced, which is this kind of um, overall invisibility, right? Um, and then the kind of invisibility that I talk about too, like the invisibility of labor itself or human um, existence um, behind all the objects, right? So, so uh, is it possible to be invisible, but actually the invisible is a form of resistance or is it actually just a form of uh, total um, oppression? It's, you know, obviously it's primarily that, but maybe um, there's some use in talking about that other model, I don't know, as, as just some way to open up the field as some kind of speculative other world, as not just um, indulging in cynicism, um, which certainly is a little part of it, but also um, just to think about what other possibilities exist, um, what can exist on the um, boundaries just past the feasible, or, right? So so that's also what's at stake in the, um, in the overall Pink Slime Caesar Shift project, right? So it's this idea of um, obviously, um, you can't make, uh, it's all about taking um, these beef cells and using them as a new network for labor organizing, which is not really feasible. The science is true, but the, um, the structures to make that happen on a large scale are not true, but it's, it sits on the boundary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so like this idea, like I'm really intrigued by this idea of like, well, it, this is art, right? I'm not, I'm not an activist per se, right? Um, I'm not directly addressing um, policy. What I'm interested in is trying to, um, of course, bring a certain amount of consciousness, but also to see um, how we make new ideas possible, how we understand things differently, and that as a means to kind of work towards the future. So, so all these kind of things of like these, these ideas that kind of sit um, right at the edge of reality. Um, and that's the kind of approach I take with the other texts that I draw in, like these kind of like, um, I don't know, industrial catalogs, uh, corporate manuals, <laughs> you know, like in the video itself, things like um, how does a corporation um, prepare for protests, right? and accommodating protests or um, what is um, e-waste recycling according to uh, the Dell Corporation, the Dell Computer Corporation versus, right, some of these other stories, right, and sort of like getting them all to kind of, uh, they all originate in the real world, but combined with each other, they start to create um, a different kind of world, a kind of cross-section that we're not usually allowed to acknowledge and we're not allowed to see. Right? Um, and that's the moment at which it, it pushes the edges of the boundaries of reality because everything is very much sort of separated, right? And they're, they're supposed to exist in their own sort of uh, delineated universes um, without consequence to each other. But once you start building the consequence, right, then something else happens. 
I hope that addresses the question. Yeah, that was really nice yes. to, uh, to, to see from that side and also like, um, yeah, invisibility is, is, is something that we, that we recognize and, and, and see in your, in your work a lot as a, yeah. and then also fluidity. Yeah. And, and in the volumes, there is um, the, the way that um, a lot of the workers tell about them seen from the outside. Yeah. It's also as an othering uh, figure and several places there is mentioned these water me metaphors, um, like these very fluid uh, metaphors um, of, of um, the workers being called uh, fishing sisters um, mm -hmm. or drifters, which is not a water metaphor, but something that's very uh, move, moves um, and floats. And yeah, I don't really know if I have a question for this more as of maybe bringing out the fluidity of, of maybe speaking about uh, your practice a bit more mm -hmm. um, in terms of how this concept or this other also part of um, what you find in the texts uh, are linked to your to your practice. Right. Um... And I really want to encourage if anybody has questions from from the audience. Yes, also, we before, have. I just wanted to um, five minutes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we really need to stop on time. And I think it's best to at least officially do so. Um, and we can always uh, stay a little bit onwards um, for those that are interested. But but yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, questions <laughs> if anyone has. I'm gonna uh, while while we wait for any possible questions, I will. I I don't know, Nina, if the question was exactly about liquidity, but I can just speak about it for a moment, um, if that helps. Um, so you can see here the Yangshan uh, Deep Water Port, Shanghai. That was actually one of the places that I was meant to do a reshoot. I do actually have some um, um, footage that we took from there. <laughs> And it is a crazy place. It's a crazy place. Um, and uh, and um, the uh, so the uh, gold loop, um, the version that I showed with you guys, uh, it's the gold loop actually triad in a bracket. Um, so it's a kind of uh, different version of a piece uh, that is not done. <laughs> still not done. It's still not done. So, um, but uh, the, it was shot between um, Birmingham, UK, and then also um, Dishui. Now, Dishui is actually the um, southernmost part of Shanghai, technically. And it actually, if you look on certain kind of um, map, uh, not updated map, um, a digital map systems like actually Google weirdly, I believe, and you look at where I shot, um, uh, which yes, sorry, is not only the southernmost part of Shanghai, but is the last kind of part of Shanghai before you take this hour and a half long water bridge to get to Yangshan Deep Water Port. Mm. Right? Um, so it's like the last civilization, right? Before you go to this like deep water port island. So, um, so it, when you look at digital maps of this Dishui area, not the Yangshan Deep Water Port, but before that, um, you actually see that it's actually underwater, um, and that actually it's a rather new uh, construction as well that was reclaimed from that which was under under sea, um, and it's a perfectly circular lake uh, made out of um, just reclaim. Uh, rec I mean, it's just carved out of you know, the ocean that was always the ocean and they built land around it. Um, and so I was intrigued by like, you know, a recent talk about liquidity, right? Obviously not what we don't want to get too far into this, but then also um, um, that related to these metaphors of um, actual people and um, uh, workers who are, um, yes, put down for being like liquid. Like these workers themselves are liquid. They are fish 
sons or like fish daughters right and they're part of a kind of like uprising wave like this kind of blind flow which is like that water metaphor for the kind of migrant moves and then but then it, it's like connected to all these containers that are just being shipped out everywhere right and so like this kind of like the metaphor builds on the metaphor and builds on the metaphor builds on the metaphor right um and with that it's eleven thirty. yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much it's really been wonderful this this conversation we've had yeah. And it yeah, it might just be the two, the three of us <laughs> that's going <laughs> to say goodbye um, on behalf of, of all of us. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, the laboratory with Dea and um, yeah, thank you for joining us on this uh, Sunday. Yeah, sunny so Sunday much. in Denmark and in, in the US. Have a wonderful night, guys. Um, I had a lot of, uh, yeah, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I always feel like we lack time, but I'm like, how can we, like, <laughs> how is it always possible? But, I know. Um, so I don't know who attended, but thanks for attending. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah, yes, very well. much. Well, Hi, Dan. Hello, Dan. Okay. Thank Bye. you so much. Of course, of course. It was, um, yeah, very, very interesting and um, yeah, pressing, very pressing issues and uh, yeah, a lot more to yeah to be talked about and discussed.